Hello, everyone, and welcome to this month's Northwest ATTC webinar. I'm Jennifer Verbeck, and I'm your host for today. We're excited to have Thomas Bialazor presenting for us today on behavioral health workforce support, current state and future opportunities. And this is part of a, a three-part series that addresses innovative and successful approaches to staff recruitment and retention. And that series kicks off with Tom today, and it'll go through um, the month of September. Okay. Next slide, please. And if you want any more information about this three-part series, it's up here on the slide, and you can also visit our website where we'll have um, registration information and um, the, the dates will be on there as well. Next slide, please. Couple of quick housekeeping things. First, if you have any questions for our presenter, please type them into the chat box at any time and we'll try to answer as many as we can at the end of the presentation today. Next slide. You'll also be getting an email at the end of today's webinar that has a link to a survey in it. Uh, please make sure you take that survey. It helps us make sure we're bringing you the content you're most interested in. That email will also have a link to download the slides from today and a link to our website where you'll be able to find a recording of this webinar. And that should be available on our website within the next week or so. Our, our web specialist is out of the office, so it might take a little bit longer than um, past webinars, but we will have it up there. Next slide. Additionally, we'll be sending everyone who attends this live webinar a certificate of attendance, and it takes a, us about a week to get those out. You don't need to do anything to get the certificate unless you're watching this in a group. If that's the case, please have someone in the group email us within a business day with the names and email addresses for everyone who wants a certificate, and our email address is up there on the slide. It's northwest at attcnetwork.org. Next slide. Now on to the webinar. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker today, Thomas Bialazor, who has worked as a social worker and program manager in Oregon settings that include nonprofit organizations, local government, and health plans for the past 20 years. Tom currently holds the position of Director of Behavioral Health with Care Oregon, which focuses on supporting individuals enrolled in Medicaid and Medicare. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Tom. Thank you so much for your time today and for joining us. Great. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Well, it's a magnificent summer day here in downtown Portland, Oregon. If anything, maybe a little bit on the roasty side, uh, but I hope it's a fantastic day wherever you're dialing in from. We're so grateful to have you join us today for a conversation on strategies to support the behavioral health workforce in your community. Before I begin, I'd like to provide a special thank you to the Northwest Addiction Technology Transfer Center Network, the University of Washington, and all of this with the support of SAMHSA for making today's session possible. If we can move forward to slides. Okay, before we start, a few housekeeping items. The first is that I'll use the term behavioral health a lot in this presentation. And this really is an umbrella term that's meant to be inclusive of both mental health and substance use disorders. The second item, please do take care of yourself during this hour, whatever that looks like. This is the noon hour, so eat your lunch, stand up, feel free to doodle, or launch this training on the Zoom app on your phone and get outside for a walk, whatever works for you. The third item, you know a little bit about my current work. Uh, as Jennifer mentioned, I'm the Director of Behavioral Health with a health plan that supports members enrolled with Medicaid. And you know, a lot of what I'm going to speak about today will be from my vantage point, working in a health plan, working with community-based mental health and SUD providers, and also connecting with colleagues at the state level who are working on similar topics. And so a few of these caveats um, for today's conversation, not all of these ideas will be necessarily novel or new. But in the interest of being more comprehensive, I'm going to try to cover a little bit more ground and less depth, hoping that you might be able to take away something that you can use in your setting. Also, we have time that's built in for you to share what you've seen work related to this topic. And above all, our hope is uh, not necessarily that you use all of these ideas, but really that um, you know thinking about what's offered here today, 
what you hear from your colleagues, or if there are ideas of your own that you want to really double down on, that some of these are ideas are new or renewed relative to the direction where you can where you can go for workforce support in your community. And the last point, I'm going to talk a little bit about what our field has gone through in terms of collective trauma and loss as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. This is all going to be in the next section, and I want to take a second to flag this as a potential trigger warning topic and just let you know that you can step away if you feel like you need to for the next five minutes or so. This could apply if you've had a recent or especially acute personal impact from COVID-19. And with that, I will give a pause. Okay, let's head into the next section. So whether we're talking about, you know, what's happened to so many of us across the country, the clients we serve or ourselves, there have been so many profound impacts from the COVID-19 pandemic. The fear of getting COVID, all the related impacts uh, from getting COVID, the economic and financial stress, all of those elements really ha has taken its toll. For those who've lost family and friends, loved ones or neighbors too soon, there is really an undeniable felt sense of individual and collective loss and trauma and pain. There have been extended periods of isolation. Kids who are not able to be in school in person for the better part of two years. Older adults who were disproportionately isolated from social connections or from family support. Also, we've seen return to use and overdoses at an unprecedented rate. And I think the bottom line is that, you know, there's really been this acute psychological pain and emotional suffering for a large part of the population for the last two plus years. And the Bayboro Health System has really been here as the safety net for receiving and intervening in so much of that. And I don't know if we've really had, you know, fully had enough time to take stock of the loss, the trauma, all the lasting impacts of the last two years. And in behavioral health, you know, we're really the ones that hold it all together during these times. And so much of that effort has required a sort of uh, tunnel vision or a single mindedness uh, on the part of providers in order to make it through these times. Let's move to the next slide. So, you know, as I uh, spoke to in the last slide, uh, there really has been a, a marked uh, increase in substance use. The National Institute of Drug Abuse and the National Institute of Health recently cited a study in the Journal of American Medical Association or JAMA which reported increases in the number of positive drug screens ordered by healthcare providers and the legal system. And the results in the JAM article highlighted that there are positive screens for fentanyl, cocaine, heroin, and methamphetamine that have all increased from previous years. Next slide. Uh, previous, oh yeah, that one. Uh, so, you know, important disclaimer here, and there, there's often a lag on this data, but we do have some reliable data at this point that's comparing the first full year of the pandemic in the United States, so April 2020 through April 2021, and the Center for Disease Control was reporting that more than 99,000 people across the country died from overdoses. And this represents an increase of nearly 30% from the 77,000 who passed in the previous 12 months. The CDC also reports that approximately 75% of the deaths during the pandemic's first year relative to overdose were tied to synthetic opioids such as fentanyl. And you know, anecdotally, we've been hearing this a lot in the communities that we serve, but to see the numbers rolled up like this at the national level is really staggering. Uh, next slide. So, you know, you've likely heard the term the great resignation and the healthcare field has lost an estimated 20% of its workforce over the past two years. This includes an estimated 30% of nurses. There is a challenge for getting these statistics uh, from the Bureau of Labor, uh, Labor Statistics and Industries in a way where it's a bit more granular to the behavioral health level, but I think those statistics are pretty telling. I can say for someone that, that works in the health plan lens, we really have seen a shortage of nurses uh, in so many different spaces. Community teams providing assertive community treatment have lost nurses. Withdrawal management programs have been profoundly affected. There have been some withdrawal management programs in Oregon that either closed or have been on the brink of closure due to the shortage of nursing staff. And, uh, you know, what is happening in, in terms of all of these different factors and how they intersect with workforce? 
I spoke a little bit to the impacts of COVID-19 earlier, but I also think the way that we do the work has changed. Over the last two years, behavioral health has had an immediate and unexpected pivot, uh, really a crash course into moving everything except essential services to telehealth. As a community of mental health therapists, sub counselors, psychiatrists, nurses, peer support specialists, we saw some benefits of this change to telehealth with clients being more consistent with accessing care and some benefits to clients appreciating the privacy of the virtual environment. When uh, we recognize that in 2022, we still have a long way to go to destigmatize seeking help for substance use disorders and support for mental health needs. And then we also saw some clients really completely disconnect or disengage from treatment within that virtual setting entirely. When maybe dialing into one uh, more Zoom meeting or troubleshooting technology became too much. For services that were delivered in person, like said residential treatment, so many of those programs had to deal with stressors like COVID outbreaks in their programs, or clients presenting with more complicated circumstances or more compounded comorbid conditions. And so really when everything became two-dimensional, we lost something that motivates so many of us, which is the part of this work where we get feedback and energy from seeing clients get inspired to achieve success on their journey to wellness and recovery. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, you know, this is, there's a really interesting forecasting in a study conducted by Mercer, and uh, their forecasting showed that there are about 800,000, what they would term skilled or semi-skilled behavioral health workers in the United States right now. By 2026, the country will need about 900,000 of those same workers, which is more of a 10% increase in demand in that five-year period. In that time, they project that 400,000 mental health workers or behavioral health workers will leave the occupation entirely, leaving employers to fill more than 510,000 vacancies by 2026. 27 states are projected to be unable to meet the total hiring demand for behavioral health workers. And if the current trends hold, there'll be about 55,000 jobs that will be unfilled in these uh, 27 states. So the largest gaps are uh, include some states like Massachusetts, Illinois, California, Colorado. Some other states, including Washington, uh, will see a surplus over the course of that time. Now, this uh, number, you know, when you see that number of 510,000, I think it's a pretty, uh, you know, big number. It's important not to be alarmist about it, but the overall trends are definitely concerning. And uh, next slide. So in the midst of all of that, uh, you know, really thinking about the, the supply and demand, if you will, for the behavioral health workforce, there are also a few important trends that are playing out for job seekers. We're really seeing some major changes and trends with the pool of job seekers or candidates in the behavioral health workforce. The first change is that there are really changes to the employee market. Candidates are accepting positions with a higher average total compensation. And with so many open positions, you know, to be blunt, they've got leverage relative to salary expectations that's really fairly unprecedented over the last 20 years. Candidates are more likely to have multiple offers, and this has really been a game changer. A second factor is that everything is moving faster. Candidates are accepting positions that have a much shorter timeline from the interview to the offer process. So we're kind of seeing this race of who can provide the first best offer in terms of compensation, the working environment, and the job itself. And the last element is that candidates' uh, preferences are shifting. With telehealth being so prevalent and in some respects really being the default of the last two years, with the exception of some service types, candidates for either therapist or counselor jobs may have that expectation that telehealth is the job that they hope for, the job that they expect. So all of that is kind of a little bit, uh, just a slice of the backdrop of, of how we've gotten where we are. And so now I'd like to shift the conversation a little bit into some of the ideas uh, you know, that I've either observed or we uh, have been part of implementing around how we can address recruitment and retention. So let's move to the first idea. Uh, next slide, please. So in this first half, we'll be talking a bit about provider level ideas or provider level factors, and then we'll move on and, and move up to more system level factors. Uh, next slide. So this first idea really is going to come as a surprise to absolutely no one, 
but compensation matters. Salary needs to be competitive and current to market. So some questions to ask are, is a salary or a wage differential possible for shifts outside of working standard working hours for community-based work, for crisis work, and you know, even now for in-office work where face-to-face -face is the expectation for that position. And thinking about PTO relative to pay time off, how generous are PTO benefits? How do those benefits compare to other organizations? And another factor are long-term pay time off benefits possible, such as a sabbatical after five years or seven years or 10 years. A couple other factors to consider. When it comes to benefits, what is the employee's cost share for healthcare? And how much does that cost share cut into the paycheck of the employee? How recently were these benefits reevaluated? And are the healthcare networks sufficient for employees to get their own behavioral health, physical health, and dental health needs met? And then one last factor, what do employer contributions to retirement levels look like? And again, how recently was that reevaluated? How competitive is that? In terms of additional compensation, it's also important to think about other aspects like bonuses, current and future COLA levels, and also wellness reimbursements. Um, I think COLAs are really coming up a lot right now, uh, especially just due to inflation and, and so many different increases that impact the cost of living, whether it's um, housing or you know a lot of other dynamics there. So, um, so COLAs really matter and, and are important to revisit. So what does all this mean for provider organizations? Total compensation is really requiring continual reevaluation and kind of an iterative mindset in this environment. It might be a moving target for a while. And then for health plans, you may find that you're evaluating reimbursement rates because provider networks are telling you that their cost of business is going up. Uh, so we'll move on to the next slide. So the next set of ideas are really about uh, these concepts of balance, flexibility, and boundaries. So the first concept, work-life balance, can employees realistically use the PTO? You know, I think for a lot of, in a lot of different circumstances, I've heard that, you know, providers, they're very mission-driven and they don't always feel like they can use that PTO. So what structures are in place to support uh, that use of that pay time off and, and getting vacations in a way where someone can recharge and get away? Also, are alternative work schedules possible? Uh, you know, there are schedules of alternating four tens of nine hour days. I've heard recently from a large provider organization that worked really hard to implement a four ten schedule that that paid more dividends for them when they were surveying staff than compensation increases that they were able to deliver. So, um, so I think we're hearing that time really matters and the way that employees value their time is something that's important to consider relative to retention. Flexibility. Is a later start time and end time possible to accommodate employee needs? So kind of a little story here. Um, a few jobs ago, I was you know, going to take a position and it was a position where the, the time that the work started was really flexible, but the hiring manager was locked into an 8 a.m. start, I think, because of their um, just uh, personal feelings around that. And so when I was evaluating that, I was responsible for the morning, uh, you know, childcare drop in my family. And the earliest that I could get to the office was 8.15. Uh, and so that was at a point where I think the labor market was a little different. I didn't have multiple offers. I didn't necessarily have the leverage to look at other opportunities. Uh, so I was able to work this workaround for my childcare that involved dropping to another family who would then drop my child off at preschool uh, and there are a lot of moving parts there to make that 8 a.m. start time work, when in reality, it would have been pretty easy for the hiring manager to just bump that back to 8.30, and, and it would have been a fairly straightforward change, I think, from my perspective. Um, I mean, that worked out. I ended up taking the position and was able to, to make that workaround happen. But for employees and candidates in this environment, if they have multiple offers and if there's inflexibility that, it, that they deem unnecessary, they might just take a different offer. So I think that's part of the uh, importance and risk there around flexibility. Also, are there permanent or temporary uh, opportunities for flexibility during the workday where employees can schedule appointments for their own wellness or for their family needs? And then a couple other concepts here, ongoing employee development. 
Does your organization have intentional onboarding with an emphasis on relationships, gaining fluency with systems, and creating a community of support? And are there ways to identify targeted training to help employees feel really competent and support learning more in their areas of knowledge gaps? And then the last concept on this slide, time outside of work is a really important retention idea. It's important to review, you know, after hours, work expectations, whether that's crisis coverage or calls from clients, how much of the time outside of work are you expecting employees to be on? Uh, and then also it's important to consider if your organization, you know, even unintentionally reinforces what I call an always on mentality. So this idea that if someone gets a work-related text or email after working hours, they're expected to respond and to bring uh, work matters back into the forefront of what they're thinking about, uh, because that is just, again, one of those um, ideas that when employees feel like they can have those boundaries and when their personal time has that level of separation, uh, it, it can be easier to really uh, have that environment where their, their work can be sustained over time. Uh, next slide. Great. So here's another idea. You know, I had talked about this a little bit before about how everything's moving faster. So an idea relative to human resources, it's really critical to review the data that you have on turnover, employee turnover. So looking at that at, at every credential type, if you could look at it for the last five years, the last three years, the last 12 months, and even the last six months, and paying some special attention to the last six months, have your employee turnover rates increased? At what rate? And are there specific positions that are turning over at higher or lower levels than other positions within your organization? Another idea here, is it possible for you to review exit interview information? Are there themes in why employees are leaving your organization? How do those themes intersect with your organization's action plans to address retention? And do the themes change your organization's priorities with retention efforts? And then the last idea is, you know, looking at your current exit interview questions. Are you getting the information that you need that speaks to information like compensation and benefits and workload, organizational culture, issues of equity, diversity, and inclusion? And so if you're able to tweak and adjust your questions to get better information in the future, you might be able to find more of what the drivers are for what's causing that turnover and ways to address it to support retention. Next slide. So in this next slide, I wanted to talk a little bit about kind of three related concepts. Uh, and these relate to engage, encouraging, and adapting to feedback. So uh, this first idea, engagement. Engagement drivers are these concepts that keep staff connected to their work. In my organization, we survey employees about these we actually have little playing cards that have these engagement drivers on them, and we use these to emphasize these concepts in one-on-ones to understand more of what's important to each person. And then we work with a company called Talent Tonic, and they've been great to help us take these ideas further to implement the surveys and distribute the materials. But I think engagement is really a concept better explained through examples. So if you think about work environment drivers, those would be those qualities, you know, associated with someone's work surroundings or their team environment. Uh, and so to think about what matters, does it matter that someone feels appreciated and valued? Does it matter that they feel like they can make a positive impact in their work? Uh, how important is it that there's really a great spirit of teamwork and that they see people pulling together? Are new ideas valued and appreciated? So some of those are examples of work environment drivers. Work drivers relate more to someone's individual work and individual projects. So does the level of challenge meet someone's expectations? Are they given substantial responsibility? Do they have the resources and tools to be successful? Uh, manager drivers would be things like, I can trust and respect my manager. My manager gives great feedback. My manager gets facts before making judgment or taking action. And then another category of engagement drivers would be organizational drivers. So, um, you know, items like the organization's mission and purpose really align with my individual mission and purpose. And I believe in the organization's reputation and the work they're doing in the community. 
the organization's real values were consistent with the values that they uh, aspire to. So with all of that in mind, you know, going further with those engagement drivers and understanding how those connect for individuals, for teams, uh, those are all ideas that, you know, when you're tuned into those, they can help you, you know, better retain employees. Uh, the next example I hear on here is, uh, I have on here is about recognition. So, you know, again, just a, another quick, super quick story. Uh, this uh, concept that we've heard a lot, you know, thank you, healthcare heroes. This has been a really common refrain. Uh, and I've got the good fortune to live near a world-class hospital here in the Northwest. And day after day through the pandemic, you know, uh, we really um, believe that hospital workers and healthcare workers have been doing heroes work and they've been saving lives. And there have also been so many efforts in communities to recognize and celebrate this. In the community that I live in, it looks like windows painted with messages that say, thank you, brave healthcare workers. We can do this together. And early on in the pandemic, you know, at the end of shift change, community members in my neighborhood stand outside of the hospital at shift change and have a clap out to show their appreciation for healthcare workers. And, you know, I, I want to just be really clear. I'm, I'm really glad for it. It's, it's well-deserved on every level. And I would also argue that the work of behavioral health professionals throughout the pandemic was also life-saving in so many ways, but it was so much more unseen. So, you know, where I'm going with this, at the individual level, at the community level, can we emphasize that the behavioral health workforce needs to be celebrated? And how do we amplify that message? So thinking just a little bit about the individual level, you know, the first thing is, uh, how can we understand uh, all of those ways where giving recognition is such an individualized element? So understanding how each individual, how recognition, you know, fits for them. That's, that's the first thing I think to be attended to. The second thing is, um, are there systems that you can put in place uh, that make it possible to create, you know, more visible recognition for staff that are doing amazing work every single day. Uh, in my workplace, we have a system that we can use to give digital kudos that can be shared and visible throughout the organization. Uh, the people managers in my organization often challenge each other to use that on a regular basis. Uh, and then it creates a really great tale where everyone's uh, recognitions are basically lined up over time. And it's a really powerful thing to read. So in addition to recognition, I want to talk about one other idea, which is culture of feedback. So culture of feedback and creating an organizational culture of feedback to support retention is really about two things. Is there an environment where employees can be radically candid at work, where they're authentic about their needs, perspective, and their thoughts? And a quote that I like, uh, you know, about this concept from a training on culture of feedback is, it turns out that when people trust you, and believe that you care about them, they're much more likely to, number one, accept and act on your praise and criticism. Number two, tell you what they really think about what they're doing well and not doing so well. Number three, engage in this same behavior with others. Number four, embrace their role on the team. And number five, focus on getting results. So the challenge is, how do we foster this as organizations? And once we get this feedback, how do we act on this to change organizational culture? Uh, and this really could almost be its own training. We do in fact actually have a training that we are working on uh, to support our, our provider network that has a lot of these ideas in mind. And let's go to the next slide. So I think the big elephant in the room about what we haven't talked about yet is really workload and managing workload because workload is such a driver for retention and whether someone stays or whether they leave. So we're going to see if we can engage you into participation here. If you could click on the link that uh, Jennifer dropped in the chat box or take your smartphone and with the camera, scan the QR code that's on the screen here, that's going to take you to a poll link. And that link is by Mentimeter. And in that poll, if you could, uh, it's a, going to produce a word cloud. So if you could uh, pop in either one or two or three words, or short phrases about strategies that you've seen that have really helped managing workloads in a time of, you know, really increasing workloads and, and there's really kind of more to do than ever. So we'll give you about a minute to drop in your ideas 
and then we'll share that in the next slide. I'm seeing an amazing list come through here. Uh, Jennifer, can we move to the results slide? Um, can you click once more on the refresh? Okay, it looks like our results slide is not working. Uh, but I have got a solution. Uh, I'm going to uh, use this as a screen cap. And then, uh, Jennifer, I'm going to send you the results slide in an email if that works. And if you could drop that results slide picture into the, um, into the chat, everyone can see the visual. There's a lot of amazing ideas happening here. I don't know if uh, people will be able to see a visual, but I can I can put the results with numbers in the chat box. Oh, and you know, the other thing I can actually do, I can share the link to the results. So why don't I do that? Okay, and yeah, then... I can put the link in the chat box and people could click on it that way. Great, I'm gonna drop it in there. Okay. So if you wanna see our results, the link to the results of the survey are in there. And I will highlight, it's an incredible list. I'll highlight just a few that help with managing workload. I'm seeing concurrent documentation, ability to set boundaries, looking at reasonable caseload sizes, realistic deadlines, helping staff to not work on the weekends, supporting time management, looking at paperwork redundancy, eliminating administrative burden, this is a fantastic list. Uh, so I'm sorry we're not able to show the results live, uh, but if you're interested in seeing the full list, just click on the results link in the chat. And those are a lot of these amazing ideas that our uh, participants have brought forward today. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, so now we're gonna move forward to a few provider level recruitment ideas. Next slide, please. So a few recruitment ideas. This first idea is, uh, and then can you click once more, Jennifer? I think there's a cycle graphic that comes up. Yep, great. Change the cycle time. So this is really an HR focused slide. I think it's really critical to look at the time between application screening, interview scheduling and the interview process and the offer stage. Uh, because really, you know, what's happening, if there are multiple offers coming in and you have a gap between those three stages, what you might find is you settle on a candidate that you want to hire, but they may have other offers coming in before you're able to get through getting your offer out the door. So the cycle time for candidates really matters more than it ever has before. And the next idea, track the delta. So it's important, again, to take that data in and look how far apart is your organization on declined offers with candidates. This is really a valuable tool to help quantify how the market has changed. And then there are there factors other than compensation that are causing candidates to decline offers, like work schedule, lack of affordable housing, or other dynamics. Uh, next slide, please. So here's another uh, recruitment idea. And really this is about marketing to additional incentives of the job. So there are a number of different loan repayment programs. So I think I imagine many of you are familiar with HRSA awards that are tied to uh, commitments either to specific sites for behavioral health care or tied to rural areas. And so you know that program is available at the federal level. Also individual states, might have programs that have different eligibility criteria that offer loan repayment. 
uh, that's different from the HRSA programs. Oregon has a program like that. And in some respects, they, they meet some of those gaps or those areas that aren't covered by those HRSA awards. Uh, so if there's loan repayment, is that something that's being marketed? Tuition assistance. This is an employer paid benefit where an employer pays or you know, some part or all of the cost of an employee's cost to attend college university classes. Licensure supervision. Does your organization offer licensure supervision toward CADC, LCSW, LPC? Uh, you know, what I'm finding is this isn't a benefit across the board. It's not offered by every organization, but it's if it's one that you do offer, it's important to market it. And then the last idea, other perks. Does your organization offer wellness reimbursement? Are there pathways for career growth and development? And uh, next slide. So now we'll talk a little bit about some system level ideas that uh, feed into recruitment and retention. So let's jump into the first one. So here are a few uh, system level retention ideas. And this first idea is engaging, uh, you know, if you've got either a payer or funder or state that's willing to fund the work of a third party wellness organization, that organization can connect with providers and perform the work in all these three categories. So surveying leadership and staff. Those surveys could uh, help get information from leadership on their organizational emphasis on employee well-being. Or they could deliver anonymous surveys for employees on well-being and how that's supported in their current organization. They can also deliver targeted supports. So they can deliver individualized or group support on secondary stress. Um, another word for that would be compassion fatigue. They can also help with programming around recognizing and addressing burnout and bringing mindfulness into practice. And lastly, they can offer recommendations to the agency that they're consulting with, whether that's additional training for leadership or strategies to sustain these interventions at the organizational level. Uh, there's really good work that can happen. We have done this uh, with a few of our provider organizations. Uh, there's one organization in this space, Tend Health, that we've worked with. Uh, that has really kind of done a phenomenal job and their area of expertise is well in the support specifically for behavioral health providers. Let's uh, jump into the next slide. So now let's talk about some recruitment ideas at the system level. So this first recruitment idea, is it possible for whether that's a health plan or payer or a state level group to fund third party recruiting firms? And there are a few benefits to this whether it's a local or national third party recruiter, they can help provider networks recruit for their highest priority vacancies. And then when you've got those recruitment firms working on those hard to fill vacancies, that work, when that's happening, that can help buy back time for that organization's human resources department to have more bandwidth for recruiting for other vacancies. Thinking about these two different options, Local firms generally uh, understand the local dynamics and they can have more data on local market trends, such as compensation. Their fee structures tend to be different. They can function as a fixed per recruitment fee. And in some cases, this can be a lower cost. And then if you think about national recruiting firms, they may have access to out of area or out of state recruitments. And their fee structures can sometimes function as a percentage of one year of annual salary. So that cost can run higher. Uh, but again, if you've got a, either a system funder, payer, state, et cetera, that's uh, supporting this idea, um, that, that can help this idea go a lot further. Let's move on to the second uh, slide, please. So, you know, the next kind of big level idea is about understanding the pipeline and trending the data. A couple of key questions here around understanding the pipeline. How many graduates are expected from local and state universities with related degrees? How strong are the connections between internships and practicum programs and community organizations? So this idea, you know, when we looked before at all of the vacant positions that will be open, uh, it's a good question to, to understand locally, is there any way we can get an approximate number on, uh, you know, how many potential candidates could be coming into the workforce? So that's really what understanding the pipeline is all about. And the second idea is advocating for better data. So can your state aggregate, aggregate workforce vacancies by credential type 
and trend those over time. Can your state licensing entities produce reports on the number of retirements? Can your state licensing entities produce reports on the number of new licensure applicants and on the number of out-of-state applicants and trend this information? Uh, so the, the big idea here, if we understand who's coming into the workforce and we understand who's leaving, can there be some system level reports to compare those two trends to understand, you know, what's that going to look like in the next two, three, four years? Next slide, please. So this uh, other system level recruitment idea, number three, is all about a workforce media campaign. So what is a workforce media campaign? This is content that's created with several different kinds of media outlets, including radio, video ads, social media, and streaming television. And this content focuses on workforce recruitment. It showcases actual behavioral health care staff, what they value about being in behavioral health care and their journey to get here. And it also includes an information toolkit for providers on how they can most effectively use social media and job postings related to best practices. And so we've actually sponsored a um, campaign that has been supported through the Oregon Council of Behavioral Health. And uh, you know, we've supported that at the funder level. They've launched a campaign called Qualified to Care, and they've done all these things. So I can give an example of what they've produced. And they've produced a media campaign and also one rolled up website that has um, different job openings in behavioral health that are featured. So with that, let's move it to the next slide. So here's an example. They have a LinkedIn page, uh, and then they also have a YouTube page that has all of these videos that are real stories that help connect how someone's journey led them to behavioral health. And next slide. So I think let's first hear from Nijay. Behavioral health care professionals create compassionate communities, breaking stigmas to ensure an equitable place for all of us. Join a community where everyone benefits from a whole health care and has a self-directed and connected life. Apply today at qualifiedtocare.org. Behavioral health care right, professionals. This is our second example. At age 63, I was Great. starting over. I wanted together. a meaningful job where I could make a difference in people's lives. Now I am part of a team helping rebuild lives every day. Join me in making a difference at qualifiedtocare.org. At age Thanks. So those are just a couple examples of a media campaign and what that can look like. We've been excited to, to launch this, and we think that idea also has great potential, and we'll continue working on that into the future in Oregon. And so, you know, we have one last slide here on workforce support ideas, really at the, at the system level. And this involves providing flexible funding to organizations, whether that's from states or health plans, and that funding can be used, you know, in a number of different ways. But here are four different categories or four examples. So the first is relocation assistance, one-time assistance that can be available to new employees, moving from out of state or moving from out of region. And uh, another idea is short-term housing assistance. This is assistance with housing costs for short, the short term that would assist either new or existing staff for whom housing may be a barrier to accepting or staying in a position. Retention bonuses. Um, there's been a lot of that happening, I think, in the space in the last few months, uh, at least here in Oregon. These can be paid retroactively to recognize the work done through the pandemic to existing staff or paid in advance for employees that would make a term of service commitment. And the last concept here is a sign-on bonus, a one-time bonus for new employees that can include a term of service agreement. And I think that's the last of our uh, ideas. Next slide. Great. So I think we've got about 10 minutes left, and I just would like to open it up for any questions, question and answer, or discussion or reflections. Maybe while people are taking a minute to type in some questions and comments, I'll just do some closing remor remarks here. Um, thank you so much, Tom, for your time today. We really appreciate you speaking with us and presenting on this 
material. Uh, please remember to fill out our evaluation survey for today's webinar by clicking on the link within the email we'll be sending out. Um, you should get that later today, or it's also posted in the chat box. Um, we'll, we'll also be doing um, a webinar next month on August 31st, and that's going to be titled Recruitment and Retention Strategies for Culturally Specific Behavioral Health Staff. Um, so be able we should have that information up on our website um, where you can register and find out more details about that. So please join us for that. And I'm not sure if I'm having some issues with the um, chat box, but I'm not able to see any of the comments that are being written in there. Mandy, are you able to see anything um, being posted in the chat box? No, I'm not. I'm not sure what's going on, but I do see quite a few people raising their hands so I could uh, go through and allow each person to talk. I'll call their name and they can uh, ask a question or give a comment. Yeah, that might that might be nice. Let's give that a try and see if that will at least allow them to either type or to to ask their questions over the microphone. That would be great. Thank you. Sure. Sorry so about that, guys. Yeah, I'll start with TK Nelson. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Wonderful. Okay, it says the chat is disabled, so that might be a moderator needs to un, you know, uh, uh, or enable the chat. Um, I think that's probably part of why you're getting lots of raised hands. Um, I would like to know um, when I pulled up the um the what ideas have been the biggest difference maker we have a a picture rather than the actual answers that people relied even though this is great i'd actually like to see what people wrote in there as well and then lastly um this i i missed the very beginning of the webinar and i'm wondering if you're sending out the um slides uh slides for that um, and also, I want to just thank you for this. Um, it's very helpful just to even um, have this well thought out um, uh, slides and presentation and kind of be able to begin to address things in this way. Um, so thank you. I'll go ahead and address the question about the slides. We will have the uh, those sent out um, at a later date. Our web specialist is out of the office this week. Um, so it might take us a little bit longer to have those posted, um, but we, we should be able to have those up on our website and she'll send out um, an email to everybody that participated today. So you will have access to those slides and a recording of the webinar today. Thank you. And then Tom, I'll let you in, um, address the question about um, seeing the results and, and all of that. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great question. So I for sure can, uh, you know, maybe even before the end of today, I can email the, the image uh, to you, Jennifer, maybe we could share that on the screen. And then I think, you know, when you look at the word cloud, some words uh, that are larger means that they were entered more than once. So I repeat ideas, they kind of go forward in the cloud, ideas that were, were written maybe once get a little smaller. And so, you know, for the sake of accessibility, what I'd like to do is just type them all out and have them all represented, you know, in like a PDF uh, to accompany the presentation. So that's something I can do for sure. Great, thank you. Mandy, um, are you able to click on another person that has their hand raised? Yeah, um, how about Carrie Ann? Hi, Thomas, thank you so much for the presentation. I'm wondering how you address the um, with the sign on bonuses and people getting, you know, new people coming in and getting, um, you know, I guess not special things, but, you know, additional things versus the people that have been in employment for a really long time. How have you managed to quell that, you know, the frustration of those long term employees? Yeah, such a great, great question, Kiri. And I think a lot of it has been about timing. And, uh, you know, I think that the challenge is, uh, you know, as much as there can be some level of, of, of synergy between using these ideas, uh, you know, we've seen providers have more success when they're, you know, evaluating compensation. And if there's some level of kind of transparency around that, and then also, 
uh, you know, if they've had funding for the retention bonuses, if they're delivering those, you know, uh, in, a, in a similar time frame that they're also delivering sign-on bonuses, uh, that has helped. Um, a lot of it's about timing, but, you know, you're absolutely right. I think it can be problematic in an organization if, you know, the only thing uh, folks see are sign-on bonuses. I think that's a really, you know, fair thing to say is, is you know, they might ask, well, um, you know, where is that, where is that come into the picture for me in terms of, of equity relative to compensation. So I think the timing and the staging of those and having like a long-term vision and, and trying to land the timing uh, matters almost more than any other factor. Great. If anybody else has some questions, feel free to raise your hand and, and Mandy will uh, call on the next person that was um, in line. Mandy, did we have anybody else? Not right now. I'll give them a couple of seconds here to go ahead and see if we get any more hand raises. There, if you're not familiar, it's down at the bottom of your screen. There's a little hand. Just go ahead and raise that, and we'll we'll go ahead and unmute you so you can ask your question if you have one. Okay. So a couple of things I would note if we scroll a few slides further, the references uh, for the studies and the data that I discussed today are included at the end of the slide deck here on 35 and 36. Uh, feel free to take a look at those if you're interested in a little bit more of the research behind, uh, you know, the first half of the presentation. And lastly, would just really like to give a big thank you and appreciation to everyone on this call for being interested in this idea. You know, I think if you're if you're joining today, that means you care and have a stake in what's happening for the behavioral health workforce and making sure that that workforce is sustained and energized and supported moving into the future so that we can do this critical work. And we just really appreciate your, your interest and in, in commitment to that idea. Thank you, Tom, and thank you to our participants for joining us today. We appreciate your time and apologies for uh, the chat function not working properly, but um, feel free to reach out to us and we'll have this recording available and the slides that you'll be getting in an email um, later this week. And we appreciate your time. <laughs>